Hello, and welcome to What is Innovation? The podcast that explores the reality of a word that is in danger of losing its meaning altogether. This podcast is produced by Outlast Consulting, LLC, a boutique consultancy that helps companies use innovation principles to solve their toughest business problems. I'm your host, Jared Simmons, and I'm so excited to have Luis Zorzella. Luis Zorzella works with financial service companies that have a strategy but are not achieving the results they expected. His firm, Amquant, works with banks, insurance companies, investment, and other service firms worldwide in the areas of growth, profitability, and innovation. In his podcast, The Strategy Taken, he interviews business leaders on how they make and implement difficult strategy decisions. He is also the author of the book, Revenue Growth, and publishes a monthly newsletter where he examines the growth drivers of the financial sector. Luis is a former consultant and expert with McKinsey and & Company and investment banker with J.P. Morgan Chase. Luis, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us. Well, hi, Jared. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. I, I really enjoy your show. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I enjoy yours as well, and uh, I'm looking forward to talking with you. Likewise. So why don't we dive right in? Tell me, in your mind, what is innovation? So innovation is, what I was ready to say, that innovation is a very inefficient way to create value. Mm. I think that when people talk about innovation, Mm -hmm. the first image that comes to mind is the thing that startups do, right? Right. And if you look into the startup world, I think we can see the venture capital sector as the gold standard. Mm. That's what they do, and they're very good at that. And I am sure that most of your listeners will have heard some scary statistics about the venture capital sector, right? That a lot of companies fail, that like it's a, it's a lot of volatility. My favorite one goes like this, right? You, you invest in 10 companies, six will flop, three will be so-so, one will actually pay for the other the other nine. Mm. The true number is actually closer to one in 20, but wow. I'm going to give you even an even scarier statistic <laughs> about the sector. The scary statistic is that in the past decade, the venture capital sector as a whole has returned pretty much the same thing as the S&P. Wow. So if you took a broad general, uh, sort of sector level investment in either of those sectors, it would pan out about the same. That's, that's yes. unbelievable. Yeah. So if you think about what that means, those firms, they have smart people, they have resources, they have connections, they have money. The only thing they do is to source, invest, manage, and exit innovators, really good ones. They have very good incentives, and they have to deal with very little legacy. And still, they basically return the same thing as the S&P and with much more volatility, which means that adjusted for risk, they they are underperforming the S&P. Right, right. So what the scenario you just described would be what one would assume is, you know, very fertile ground for innovation. A a lot of times that legacy element of things, you know, the way things were is is a real anchor on really being able to push and move innovation forward. And, And it's surprising to hear that. You know, in the absence of that, it's still a a, a difficult way to create value. It is a very difficult thing. It is, first, it is true that the sector is very good at advertising their success stories. Right. That's how they get more money from investors. (laughs) Right. And it's true that there are some firms that outperform that, even on a consistent basis. Mm -hmm. But the flip side is that if there are those that overperform, there are also those that underperform that uh, with all of those resources. Right. Because the number I gave you is an average. I think that the bottom line is that this innovation that we think about, the first thing, which is very flashy and makes very good reading, very good books and content, Mm -hmm. is actually very, very hard. Anyone who tells you otherwise is selling you something. Mm. Yeah, I think that's well put. It's a message that you'll only get from a, a very few people who actually know the facts behind the numbers and behind these percentages. So I'm excited that you're able to kind of speak from that experience. As you think about these different classes, you know, the outperform, the sort of average and the underperformers, do people move 
do investors kind of move through these sort of buckets or are there firms that consistently outperform or is it more of a function of the investor or the founder? Does that question make sense? So I, I think there is some movement. There are those that have been very consistent and like this, some of them are household names. Mm -hmm. We can, we can talk about that. And there are, there are some that move under the average, over the average. It, it is true. But I think that the interesting thing here mm -hmm. is I would say that if you think of innovation as a way to create value, mm -hmm. the model of the S&P, it's not as flashy, but it is a much more efficient way to create value than the model of the C sector. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you talk about efficiency, what goes into that in your mind? So uh, again, if you think in terms of all the resources that you put behind it okay. and how single-minded the whole sector is yep. in identifying good innovation, creating value from it, helping innovators deliver on the promise and be successful. If you think of all the resources that are directed towards making that happen, mm -hmm. It is a very messy and inefficient way. I'm not saying this as a criticism. I'm saying right. that this is the nature of innovation. It's just the reality of it. Exactly. You have mm -hmm. to be respectful of uh, how hard the whole thing is. And you have to think that if you want to really be in, in a leader who has a good innovation strategy, mm -hmm. I think that it would pay off to be more closer to the model that the innovation of the, like the, the regular S and P companies and not the Silicon Valley model. I see. I see. So we often hear the, the best when it comes to innovation, we almost often hear the best of the Silicon Valley stories and the worst of the fortune 500 S and P kind of models, the, the things that, you know, the GMs and the Fords and the PNGs and of the world do wrong about innovation because they're big and they're slow. Yes. And VCs do the right thing because they are nimble and agile and fast and they create these billion dollar unicorns. And you're saying the truth is probably somewhere, somewhere in between. Somewhere in between. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Don't take me wrong. Like the S and P is a Darwinian club, right? Like in the last decade that I said, the S and P has about 500 companies, 190 companies in the last decade fell off the S and P. So wow. it is a space that you see a lot of innovation and you see a lot of tech companies there. What you don't see is the type of innovation that, for example, you read on a book on like, like zero to one, which, mm -hmm. which is a nice book. But it's, it is not the, it's not how most of the value is created in the business world. Right. And that's the Peter Thiel book. Yeah. I like the book, but, mm -hmm. you, but that's not how most of the value is created, neither in terms of absolute value, total value, or in terms of returns. Right. Right. And, and I think that's, you know, it's almost a uh, function of innovation as entertainment versus innovation as true value creation, because the Silicon Valley stories are definitely more entertaining and more inspirational and more energizing and engaging. I agree with you, you know, the, the hit rate is different. And if you're talking about true return on your investment of time, resources, money, in order for you to get enough at-bats to hit a home run, you're going to pull yourself down to that sort of S&P kind of average over time. Yes. Yeah. So... I like the idea of one thing that I work with some of my clients. I, I like the idea of looking at competitive advantages mm -hmm. or competitive capabilities. I think that this is a term that is becoming less used because it's become a little bit washed out mm -hmm. and generic. But my definition is very different, right? My definition is that I look at, at concrete evidence that shows that the company has something that in the past, it was actually responsible for creating a lot of the, ex the excess value that the company created in the, let's say in the past few years. Mm -hmm. A lot of companies, like if, you, if you can actually see, and you see some cases that sure. companies that, I don't know, they're very good at uh, getting into new markets, or they're very good at launching new services or transforming the, the relationship. So they can capitalize on that, and they can innovate on that, mm -hmm. and they can be very successful. 
You also find a lot of stories that companies that are not creating a lot of value. And in this case, you have one of two situations. One is that you're actually creating value, but somewhere else in the organization, this value is being destroyed. So mm -hmm. your total value is actually, you look average, but right. there's, it's because you have a black hole somewhere in your organization, mm -hmm. which is actually good news because if you find what it is, you can fix it. And it means that you still have something that you can capitalize on and really innovate. Right. Or you find that you have nothing, like you're actually just returning everything close to the rest of the market, which is also very liberating because it means that you don't have to keep your secret sauce on the vault, like under lock and key. Mm. If you don't need to divert so much resources and attention to protecting your special thing, because the special thing is not so special. Right. It also creates a lot of innovation possibilities for you. Like we can start talking about like open innovation and right. working with people outside the organization and companies outside the organization to change your processes, change your products, change your uh, customer experience. Right. You can talk about not trying to differentiate yourself, like selling something that is probably good, but it's not actually something that is making that much of a difference for you anyway. Right. I worked with a company. They provided very good support to their salespeople. Mm -hmm. uh, they invested a lot in that. But then we, we looked statistically and, and two thirds of what they were doing had very little, when you account for the, what would have happened Anyway, like even mm. if you didn't have uh, uh, that support, right. like you had very little marginal impact on, on what the salespeople were, were actually doing. Mm -hmm. So that's liberating. You can actually divert all this attention and resources into more productive activities. That makes a lot of sense. I, I love the concept, the way you, you teased apart the, the, you know, creating value and destroying it as a form of neutrality almost, and then just not creating it at all on a net basis, they probably look the same, but it sounds like what you help clients do is understand the difference between those two and what that means for your innovation strategy going forward. Yes. Which is good if you look in terms of leadership development. Right. And I think that's an area that you look like a lot into, right? Mm -hmm. I think that you're talking about very, a very different program or a very different types of objectives when you are working with people who need to, for example, like neutralize whatever is destroying their value and capitalize on the things, on the capabilities that they already have. Right. Or people who are saying like, you know what, all those things that we were protecting, you don't need to do that anymore. Let's find new ways to do these things that have the potential to actually create business. Mm, right. Exactly. And, you know, I think the other key element in what you were describing is the importance of understanding what's signal and what's noise when it comes to innovation. Because as you were saying, you know, looking at the, the investment that your client was making in their sales organization, normalizing that against, okay, well, what if you did nothing? Or, you know, <laughs> what else might be going on here to separate the signal from the noise in terms of, you know, there's a lot of stories you can tell yourself with data, especially in the world of innovation and innovation strategy, because by definition, we're working in a space that is unknowable, right? Yes. Because we're dealing with the future and creating it and managing it and shaping it. And so I really like that example of helping people kind of tease apart what signal and what's noise in this space and what should you plan against versus what stories are you kind of telling yourself based on what you're seeing? Yes. For example, like I say, in your line of work, mm -hmm. when you have all this like signal and noise, what is the hardest thing from a leader's perspective on how to deal with that? Yeah, I think, you know, the things that, that I've seen tend to be the journey going from what you believe to what you know. Mm -hmm. Because I think what I usually see is leaders, when they see something, see a set of data or information, they draw immediately go into drawing a conclusion. You know, what do I make of this and what decision should I make next? And then, you know, when you're managing a P&L, that's probably a, a less problematic way to do it. But if you apply that to innovation, sometimes you can draw problematic conclusions from data that you don't fully understand. Yes. That's been my experience with that. I don't know if that lines up with yours. You and I, the cool thing about this conversation is you and I, you know, occupy the same world of innovation and, you know, growth, but we've grown up sort of in different sectors. 
So that's why it's cool to see the overlap in the, in the experience and the and the observations at a leadership level. Yeah, I find that uh, doing the, like interviewing people is actually that's one of the best things about this. Like you yeah. learn so much about what you're uh, about the experiences and the and the areas of other people. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, I would imagine when, as I'm looking at it, it's, you know, people looking at toothpaste or, you know, batteries or milk or something and, you know, looking at the data for it or the consumer reaction to it or the technical data for it and drawing conclusions about innovation. What's the analogous data set in the financial services world or what data do they gather to try to make decisions about innovation? That's a good question. Right? So, for example, one that you will find a lot of um, leaders in financial services, they will tell you that one of their differentiations or one of their competitive advantages or capabilities is the relationship they have with their customers. Mm -hmm. In most cases, you will see that this is actually a little bit of like, I don't know, I don't know what to say, so I can I can say about something that is very diffuse as like a, a good relationship. Right. But then you, what, you, what you do is that you can apply some statistical models to see, okay, does this actually hold true? Can you actually link this to increase loyalty or increase profitability mm -hmm. or increase the growth? or something that you can tie to a value metric. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of cases, you can't. In a lot of cases, if you just ask the customers, their customers are going to say, yes, I love the, <laughs> I love the attention and the relationship you give to me. Right. Um, but when you actually tie this to results, you see that it, it's not the customer's fault. It's not that they were lying. They truly believe that they, that, that they appreciate that. But you'll see that often how happy they are with re the relationship has very little correlation with growth or loyalty mm. or an NPS score, profitability, or anything like this. Interesting. It must be very difficult to help a leader think beyond that. If I've got this data in my hand that says my customers love me, why would I change anything? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So I worked with a bank, right? Their clients love them. And because they, they had very long relationship with those clients. And it was true. Like you can actually verify this. The data was actually um, saying that the clients loved them and they have very good, stable, long-term relationship with them. The problem is that because they had long-term relationships with these clients, all of their processes, culture, capabilities, every systems, everything the bank was fine-tuned to the existing business. So right. every time you wanted to get into a new market or bring new clients, they were not fine-tuned for that. They were fine-tuned to like deal with people that they had been dealing with in the past 20, oh, 30 years. Right, right, right. So that's true in any sector that efficiency is a very big driver of performance, right? Mm -hmm. Probably if you are in business, everything that you have is fine-tuned and specialized to, the, to what you have today. And recognizing this and having a, a program to deliberately rely on what the data and what information your insights are telling you and changing this, it, it is difficult. It, mm -hmm. it requires a lot of like people development and relationship development and requires a lot of working with the stakeholders. I can imagine you know, you getting engaged with clients focused on growth, thinking about their value metrics and things like that. I could imagine that based on your description of where the challenges often lie, there's a people element to that that could require some, some effort and uh, investment. How do you help? And I find something similar in, in, in my work. How do you help clients think about investing in their people? to help solve their classic value metric problems? I will answer this with an anecdote, right? Mm -hmm. I tell you that I have, throughout my career as a consultant, I've been a consultant for 20 years now, right? Mm -hmm. uh, throughout my career as a consultant, the single most common advice that I've gave to my clients has been, they should focus. This is where the magic happens. Focus on this. Try not to get distracted by other things. 
And a few years ago, I had someone, a coach, help me with my business. And the first thing that he told me was that uh, I had to focus, that my, my own area, was, uh, <laughs> my own consulting firm was not as focused as it should be. Mm -hmm. And it was a hard pill to swallow, right? Mm -hmm. But I think that the big advice that I would give is that, yes, it is difficult. Even a lot of things that you know that you have to do are difficult to do. To have someone who is very well structured and can provide you with guidance through this period and be an accountability partner and push you to actually make those difficult strategic decisions um, is actually quite valuable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can attest to that as well. Having similar support has been very important to me as well. And I think the broader sort of environment, corporate culture and environment around investing in leaders and investing in people I think it's starting to shift such that people are starting to understand that, that it does have an impact on the bottom line. We've been thinking about leadership, culture. We've been thinking about decision-making and professional development and all those things for decades now. And people are starting to draw some more longitudinal kind of conclusions. I think that can help with those conversations, but there's still always that initial, like you said, that difficult sort of pill to swallow of there's no process that's going to fix this. You can't go implement from in my world. It's, you can't go implement lean. You can't go implement, you know, value engineering. You can't go implement these other things and expect those things to just to solve your problems because the people that operate them are the governing factor in how impactful they are. I, you know, it sounds like it's, you've seen similar things. Yes. Um, so Jared, the, if you, if you look at this, when, when you get into innovation, most of the challenges are things that will go contrary to your, most people's nature. Mm -hmm. At least it, go, it goes contrary to my nature, right? So I yeah. said, we started this conversation saying that like the image of innovation that most people have is actually not the best one in terms of creating value. Mm -hmm. Or we talked about like the, the, the competitive capabilities and how you can actually see that it's good that you, if you don't find any, or it's good that you see one thing is being destroyed. You have to trust the data, trusting the, the, what the insights are telling you enough to act on that is very difficult. This is why most people don't do that. <laughs> right. Exactly. So having some, yeah, this is why having someone to support you on the development side is extremely valuable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I wonder in terms of, um, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about what innovation is. Do you have any thoughts or insights about what isn't innovation? Again, I started the saying that innovation is a very inefficient way to create value, right? So mm -hmm. innovation is at least the useful type of innovation is not the one, it's mostly it's not the one, the flashy one. Mm -hmm. 80% of the innovation is not the one that will drive headlines. Most innovation will be identifying things that you already have that are underdeveloped, but has the potential to move the needle, taking a hard look at yourself and having a good assessment of what capabilities you have and what mm. creates value and of what you're doing and what doesn't and, and having a plan for that. Preparing yourself, so like, again, all the discussion about you being fine-tuned, you being really, really good at the things that you are doing today, but not at the next thing that you need to do. Right. And having a single-minded attitude of pursuing this goal. I like the idea of pursuing a goal rather than the, either the traditional plan and execute type of uh, thing. I think that nobody believes in that anymore these days. Mm -hmm. But I think that also the companies that try to go to agile, they run the risk of becoming too reactive. I like the idea of like just having a clear goal and having a clear plan to pursue it. And mm -hmm. you can adjust, you can, you can adapt. I think that this is a very nice middle term between. Mm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I agree that things exist on the extremes in terms of agile versus this plan and execute sort of mindset. I like your phrasing around pursuing a goal because you set the goal and you start in that direction. And as life happens, as the world happens, you make adjustments and yes. keeping that simple, but not easy yes. is I think critical. It's a great point. Are there other sort of identifiers of 
companies that are good at innovation are doing it the right way in the sector versus those that aren't? What are there, you know, hallmarks beyond sort of some of the things we've talked about? So uh, I think that the, I gave you the four that are, mm -hmm. for me, the very good ones. They have very good statistical correlation with actual value created. So companies that are good at identifying things that they already have, that if developed the right, the right way, can move the needle. Mm -hmm. And you can define move the needle in several different ways. Of course. For me, it's something that is detectable, even if you didn't publish that, even if you didn't tell anyone about it. Mm -hmm it will feel the difference, right? Mm. Two is to take a hard look at both the opportunity to see that it's really there and take a look at, and at yourself as an individual, as a company, as a leader, and say that, yes, I do have these capabilities. I can actually create value like through this, or I can't, and I need to plan accordingly. Mm -hmm. Prepare yourself, which is identify how you are fine-tuned to what you're doing today, and but not for the next thing that you need to do and then have a plan to pursue and pursue this goal like and to say as life throws you curveballs you adapt but you always keep your eye on the price mm, that's perfect i like it because it's concrete they're observable and they are not rooted in specific metrics so you know you can apply your own situation to each of those and i, I like that a lot yes yeah yeah that's that's great any advice, Louise, for future innovators or current innovators out there? For future innovators, I think my biggest advice is, as I said, I think I would resist the temptation to look at the flashy, stereotypical image that, that a lot of people have around innovation. Think about more pragmatical, what are the sources that uh, actually can make a difference and move the needle in your sector or in your career, or whatever arena you're playing, mm. right? And believe in those insights and don't uh, believe on the hype. Well said. Trusting the insights over the hype is great innovation advice. It's great life advice. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, Luis, yeah. I really appreciate you making time to share your thoughts with us, your experience over your two decades of consulting and financial services and innovation, growth, profitability. It all came through today. And really, I think, I learned a lot. I'm sure our listeners have learned a lot as well. So thanks again for your time and uh, we'll have to do it again. Absolutely. I would love to. Uh, thank you, Jared. All right. Take care. We'd love to hear your thoughts about this week's show. You can drop us a line on Twitter at Outlast LLC, O-U-T-L-A-S-T LLC or follow us on LinkedIn where we're at last consulting. Until next time, keep innovating, whatever that means.